Welcome back, Team DWC. Got another Money Monday video for y'all. Let's go ahead and get to the videos. over here in DWC pots and there's the botanium pineapple eggplant flower eggplant eggplant oh, you want to build up all of these profiles I don't care what you've heard out there I don't care uh, what someone what someone has said hey just done in Brad Street or hey just worry about experience hey just worry about Equifax I want you to make a vow, not to me, not to Rad, not to whoever you're watching this with. Make a vow to yourself and to your business that you are going to spend time building out each of your what I call the big three. Your experience, your business, uh, your, your experience, Equifax and your Dun & Bradstreet. Now, I'm going to add credit safe on there for a couple of reasons that I'm going to give you guys as this presentation goes on. Reason why I'm gonna get, the reason why I'm going to give you credit safe, spoiler alert, is they're starting to grow here in the U.S., they're really big overseas, over in Europe, over in the UK, but they're starting to really grow here in the US. And it's one that we've been watching really closely because now banks and lenders are starting to tap into credit safe a lot more. And so I'm obviously going to give you guys some accounts that you can add to your profiles to help build that up and help strengthen up your profiles. But don't neglect any of these profiles because you never know which one the bank is going to pull from in addition to your personal credit. Because right, that's another thing that I often hear is, well, I can just personally guarantee everything. And we actually had a call with a, a relationship manager that we brought in, which is a business banker, um, one of the best in the country for U.S. Bank or from U.S. Bank. He spoke uh, in one of my calls on Tuesday, actually Tuesday that just passed. And I have some clients that were on that call. So if you guys are, are on here, you guys can kind of back this up. If you were if you were on that call, he mentions, hey, yes, we're taking a look at personal credit, but we're also now starting to have some of these merger scores where we're also taking a look at your business credit profiles. And so he specifically mentioned Experian and Dun & Bradstreet, which I thought was interesting because a lot of us think that, well, Dun & Bradstreet isn't normally checked by banks, but banks are starting to, especially more now, check Dun & Bradstreet, at least the way that your profile is aligned. And they're also checking your Experian and your Equifax. So starting out with the big boy, right? The head honcho. It's going to be done in Bradstreet, which is the largest business credit bureau. Now, most suppliers, most leasing companies are going to use the data that's on here because it's just shared just across the entire network because they have so much data on our businesses. Right. They real quick, Irv, Go ahead. real quick, real quick. I want to I want to make this. I want to make sure people are awake right now because we're going to dive into some super juicy stuff. Right. Mm, go ahead, go ahead. So let's see this on a scale of one to ten. I'm going to say this on a scale of one to ten. How well is your Dun & Bradstreet built out? Be honest. Be honest because we need to know what to focus on as well. Yes, yes, yes. Good Under question. 10. Okay, we have a zero. We have one. We have zero. We have one, zero, one, eight, one, three, zero, zero. Okay, we have a lot of work to do with Dun & Bradstreet. Okay, I'm just gauge. I'm going to gauge the room through this. Okay, so when we get to each bureau, I'm going to gauge the room with honest answers. So that way, Irv can know what to speak more about on each slide as well. So if he has additional thoughts, he's just gonna pour into you guys. Guys, we are not gatekeeping here. We are literally pouring this all into you, okay? So it's very important that when I ask a question, you give an honest answer, so that way I can read the room and we can focus on what people really need to know about, okay? So we have a lot of people with zero, one, and two, and three, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people failing class and done in Bradstreet. So preach to them, Irv, preach to them. Beautiful. I love I love to see you. Let, let, let's make sure that we can kind of help them out and, and you guys can get out of that because you, you can. Power's in your hands. And so with Dun & Bradstreet, most suppliers, lenders, and leasing companies are going to be using their data because this is where most of that data is fed. So whenever you go out and you're trying to get a commercial building, let's say leased out under your business's name, they're going to be pulling your Dun & Bradstreet report. Now, it's not like, here's the other thing. I want you to have a clear separation in your mind of when you think somebody checking your credit, how it operates in the personal realm or in the personal credit world versus in the business credit world. 
In the personal credit world, you have to get notified, meaning you are going to get hit with the hard inquiry, right? If your credit is frozen, especially for those of us that have been around the block a couple of times, sometimes you freeze your credit so that no one can pull it. Like when you go out to a bank, when you're applying for a credit card, right? But what ends up happening is they ask you to unfreeze it so that they can make that, so they can look into a real time or snapshot in real time on your personal credit. Business credit, we don't have the same laws and rules that govern us in personal credit. It's more like the wild, wild west in the business credit world. The reason why I set it up this way is because if you are applying for a, let's say for a lease or for a vendor account or for a business credit card and they go to pull Experian business side, or they go to pull your Equifax commercial or the bank or the lender or the um, or the leasing company goes to pull your Dun & Bradstreet reports, you're, you're, you'll get notified once it's been done, but they don't they don't actually have to tell you is where I'm getting at, which is why, again, I want you guys to build this out and really have that credit worthiness that we're going to be talking about here in today's session, because you want to have something known as a DUNS number, which, which is a nine digit number. Now, I don't want you to confuse this with your EIN. Your EIN is what you get from the IRS. That's like the social security number for your business. Your DUNS number is what you get and what you apply for directly with Dun & Bradstreet so that you can start getting credits specifically at the at that agency. That's how big they are. They're so big in their database that every single business has to register and have their own DUNS number in order for them to start reporting some of those trade lines that you're going to be adding, right? So if you're wondering, okay, cool, got that down. I hear it's important. I'm filling in class right now. How can I get access to a DUNS number for free? So I'm so glad that you asked because I'm going to give it to you here. So the first thing that you would want to do is you would want to go to dnb.com or dunandbrashry.com. It's a quick Google search. You can't miss it. The page needs to look like this. Now, the arrow indicates where you need to go. So you're going to hit where it says Dun's number, and then it's going to prompt you with this little drop down menu right here. From there, you are then going to click where it says get a Dun's number. Now, I'm going to speak to two kinds of people coming up in these next couple slides, so pay very close attention. The first group of us is for those of us who possibly already have a business. And so what you want to do is you are going to submit, let's say I did a mock here. So I put a zip code where our business is located, and then I put ABC, right? If your business pops up or if you see it, you'll click on it, and then it'll say, congratulations, your business already has a Dunn's number. Now, if you've been in business for some time, you have your EIN, you've already been doing some business, you have some business credit cards, you have some vendor accounts, odds are, and as a matter of fact, I'll say nine times out of 10, you most likely already have a DUNS number and you don't even know it. I can't tell you how many people I, I, I speak to day in, day out where, yeah, Irv, I've been in business since like 2015. Um, yeah, I've made a couple of purchases here and there, you know, using my LLC, using my, my, my S Corp. Um, but, you know, I, I just I haven't built up any credit. And then when I say, hey, well, you know what? You may want to go to Dun & Bradstreet and see if your business is already registered because as soon as you make one purchase, it's already reporting over on that side through your business. You probably don't even know it because it's most likely reporting as a trade reference, but that's enough for them to, again, open up a file for your business over on that side, which is going to save you a lot of time because now you don't have to wait you know, 15, 21, 30 days, however long it's taking for you to get a Dunn's number. Now, the good thing about this is that if your company appears, that means that you already have an active Dunn's number. With that active Dunn's number, most likely you already have a score. Now, some people are pleasantly surprised and they say, well, you know, out of 100, because it ranges from one to 100, 100 being excellent, one being poor, they'll say, wait a minute, I got like a 70. I haven't even really done anything to build this out. Congratulations. You have some, you know, you, you, you're on the right track for building out your business credit. And then some people, they say, this kind of sucks. Like I have a failing score. I'm at a 10 or I'm at a 20 or I had no idea that some of these accounts were even re reporting over to Dun & Bradstreet. But the good thing with this is that, again, you are already establishing, again, for those of us that already have, like if you were to do that search right now, you're already on your way. Like you've cut that time in half of how long it takes for you to get that Dun's number and you're one step ahead. But what about those of us that don't have it, right? What about those of us that are on the call 
and we're just thinking, wait a minute, dude, I I didn't see my business. I've never even seen this website in my life. You're going to have that feature right there. So I always want you to first search for your business, even if you don't have an account with Dun & Bradstreet, just because you never know. If you have the matching account, again, you're pleasantly surprised and it says, hey, your account pops up. At that point, claim the account. They're asking for a couple of things about you, your business, you know, your driver's license, copy of your LLC, your EIN. You may need to speak to an account manager on the phone. That's totally fine. Boom, you're in. But if you don't and you've searched your business at that point, you would just go ahead and select, I don't see my business. And then you would create your account and you would register your business. Now, I usually recommend just go with the free credit signal. Now, if you have no idea what credit signal is, this is essentially where you're able to monitor your credit score with Dun & Bradstreet. Now, I'm going to give you guys some additional resources later on, but this is going to give you the most in-depth, uh, what do you call it, scoring tool specific to them because they are the ones that are hosting your data versus a third-party source. So yes, every now and again, we're going to check out other other places like NAV. Every now and again, we'll check out TOEFL, right? But I always like to go directly to the source because that's a, that's a, that's exactly where it's being reported first and it's not being diluted into a third-party software. Does that make sense so far, you guys? Let me know in the chats. Rad, how are we doing? And that's over the last three or four years. And now the most recent sort of study and, and um, practice uh, by commercial growers and, and, and people pushing the, um, the, 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 the performance of the plants, I found that you can comfortably go up to about 1,200 micromoles on a 12-hour cycle, which is about, you know, it's nearly 50% more again. Um, it's about two and a half times what we used to only five or six years ago. And one way of achieving that, particularly if you have invested in a system of lighting from above, which is delivering, say, that average of about eight or 900, is to add additional light fixtures underneath and on the side. And in that case, um, if your per square footage of, of micromoles is hitting about 1,200, 12, um, that's a good return. You could push it a little bit higher than that, but you're starting to get a a reduced rate of return the more As a new content creator, you might be getting overwhelmed by all of the information that you run into about growing a YouTube channel. You might be wondering what you should focus on in order to get the most out of the efforts that you're putting into the content that you're making. And as somebody that's been making videos for YouTube for over nine years now, I'm here to tell you there's a lot of things that you can do that will keep you busy, but won't really make a difference when it comes to growing your YouTube channel. But there are things that if you focus on them will make a big difference when it comes to growing your channel. Channel. So I'm going to lay it all out for you so you don't have to worry about wasting time on things that are not going to make a difference at all. And we're starting right now. And by the way, if this is your first time here, my name is Nick. And if you want to learn how to grow your channel and learn how to use all the tools that make content creation easy, make sure you subscribe right now so you don't miss a video that could help you. First is consistency. Now, when it comes to consistency, a lot of people connect consistency to your upload schedule. When it comes to consistency, yes, publishing on YouTube consistently is an important thing. However, However, the more important thing is that you work the process of creating content in your lifestyle so that you can ensure that you're going to be able to do it for a long period of time if that's something that you want to do. And another part about consistency before we move on is it also helps you dial in your workflow because if you're doing something on a regular basis, then it's easy to remember what you did last time. It's easy to start remembering shortcuts that you take. It's easy to start remembering where you put everything on your computer and things like that. And it just makes the process a lot easier and helps you develop your workflow in a more efficient way. Plus, if you're going to do the thing, you got to do the thing. If you're not uploading videos on a regular basis, then you're not really doing the thing. The next thing that can make a really big difference with your channel is your ability to come up with really good video ideas. And I know that sounds obvious and it sounds general, but at the end of the day, if you have a really good idea, that video can do really good compared to just copying a bunch of stuff that everybody else is doing. And I'm not saying not to make videos that other people are making if you think that you can do a better version, but what I'm saying is if you can come up with some unique stuff that you mix into that, it can make a huge difference for your YouTube channel because you'll be either the one with that content or you'll be the first one with that content. But with that said, if you're just getting started on YouTube and you don't know what videos to make and you don't know how to come up with a really good unique idea yet, it's okay. 
you can look for videos where there's a proof of concept to where you can see another creator has made something similar and it's done well, which means that people have enjoyed that video. You can absolutely do that and make topically similar videos. There's nothing wrong with it, but if you really wanna stand out and you really wanna lead the pack in your niche, coming up with really good, unique video ideas is going to be the path to get there. The next thing that will make a huge difference on your YouTube channel is taking the time to learn how to properly package the ideas that you do make videos on. Now, if this is your first time watching a video like this and you've never heard of the word packaging as it relates to YouTube, it simply means making your thumbnail and your title for the video that represents the video in an accurate way while also enticing somebody to click on it. This is a skill and an art form. You can make the best videos that anybody's ever seen and if you can't get people to click on those videos, nobody's ever gonna see those amazing videos that you're putting out. When it comes to packaging up your content, it's important to think about your thumbnail and title when you are at the ideation process because if you can't represent the idea through a good thumbnail and title, then in that particular case, it's gonna be hard to get people to respond to that awesome video that you're making to that awesome, unique idea that you're putting out. So the process looks like this. You come up with the idea of the video that you're going to make, and then you think about how you're going to package that idea, what thumbnail that you're gonna make for it, and what title that you're gonna to write to compel people to click on it. If you do this before you make the video, then you can prove that that idea is a good idea and that you're going to be able to present it in the right way that will get people to click on it and then have a good experience with the video. As a part of packaging, it's important to think about how the thumbnail and title work together because they do work together as a team to win the click. The thumbnail grabs the attention and shares a little bit of information about the video and the title is the thing that actually pulls the people into the video itself. The better you get at expressing your ideas through imagery, the better you're going to do. And one thing to make sure that you're keeping in mind is YouTube is in the process right now at the time of this recording of rolling out multi-language audio where creators are gonna be able to upload dubbed audio in different languages to their YouTube channels for every video that they create. In addition to that, you can also translate your metadata, your title and your description and your subtitles in your video. If you think about this now and you start packaging up your content where you're not relying on text to do all the work for you, then in that particular case, you're going to make your content more accessible internationally. That's a power tip for what's coming and the big opportunity that we have laying in front of us this year on YouTube. Okay, so you got your idea, you got your packaging for that idea. Next, once you publish your video, you need to learn how to measure the response because when somebody interacts with your video, YouTube is tracking how they're interacting with your content and if you learn how to measure that response through the information that YouTube gives you, you're gonna learn how to make better videos faster. For some creators, this is the least fun and most boring part of being a content creator, but it is arguably one of the most important things that you need to make sure that you're focusing on if you want to really grow your YouTube channel. When it comes to your YouTube analytics, these are some things you need to focus on. You can go ahead and write these down. The first one is your click-through rate compared to impressions. This tells you how good you are at getting people to click compared to how often YouTube shows your content to someone. This is also a way to prove that YouTube is showing your content to people. Number two is your audience retention reports. When it comes to your audience retention reports, they are a second by second graph of how people respond to your content on average. So what you wanna look for here is you wanna look for drop off points where people leave the video. You wanna look for spikes where people have rewound the video. That can also indicate that people have shared the video out at that particular timestamp. You wanna look for dips in the audience retention reports. That tells you people skipped that part. And you wanna look for flat lines. Those flat lines are gonna help you identify the content that keeps people watching and engaged the most. As a part of your audience retention report, you also wanna make sure that you are choosing from the drop down menu compared to other videos. The reason that you wanna do this is because it shows you how competitive you're being against other videos of similar length on the platform. These graphs are available for your YouTube shorts, they're available for your long form videos, and they're available for your live streams as well. So you can really dig in and you can use these to get a really good understanding of what your audience does and does not respond to. Number three is you wanna pay attention to your audience tab. The reason for this is it's going to show you how many new people that you're getting in front of compared to regular subscribers that are just coming back and watching your videos. It's gonna show you other videos that people are watching on other channels. It's gonna show you other channels your viewers are watching. It's going to show you the formats of content that they are watching the most. It's gonna show you where they're watching from and it's even going to show you the best times to publish your videos based on when your viewers are online. So make sure you're paying really close attention to all all of those things because they're all really important and you can use all of that information to make better content for the people that you're trying to reach. Next, it's important to make sure that you're thinking about how you're linking your content together. Now, this is something that nobody really talks about, but when it comes to YouTube, it's important to think about over
over time. If somebody were to watch this video, what could I tell them to watch next on the channel? If somebody's coming into this particular video over here, what playlist or series could I make to where I can drive people into that playlist and then they can sit back and binge watch some videos? If you plan those types of things out in advance, it can help you create a better archive and it can also help you lead viewers through your content in a way that makes sense to them based on their interests and what they're coming to your channel for. For this, you can use your end screens, you can use your video descriptions, you can use YouTube cards. You so in other words, since we're making a Money Monday video, we might as well show y'all the what? Playlist that covers that. Which is right here, actually. It's the one I'm in. It's my cultivating this playlist. This is all the content I got coming up. And as far as Money Mondays and my plan videos. Shout out to the plan videos. It'll either be Thursdays or Fridays. Depending on which day gets views or which day I got the video ready. But hell, either way, I got one for you at the end of the week and one for you at the start of the week. Every couple days, right? Shouts out to the owner box playlist. You can use playlist, you can use your channel page, you can use your community feed. Like there's a bunch of different ways that you can interlink all of your content together and make it easy for people to find more of the content they care about on your channel. So make sure that you are using these features and that you are thinking about how those paths could go so that you can kind of build those paths for the people that are interacting with your content. If you do this, you're going to get more views on your videos over time because you're making it easier for people to find more of the content that they care about. You're going to get more watch time for that same reason reason and you're going to get more subscribers because people are going to be watching more than one video which is going to cause them to want to subscribe to your channel once they see the additional value if they're a new viewer so when it comes to your content instead of thinking one video one video one video think playlists what can I build out as a playlist or a series and how can I link my content together to make those paths easy for my viewers to follow to find what it is that they care about on my channel. Next is distribution. So when it comes to being a content creator, obviously more views equals more impact and more opportunity. So because of that, it's important to think about where else can you put your content? So the way that I do it is I use a service called Opus Clip and with Opus Clip, it allows me to take long form videos and live streams and stuff and it automatically cuts them up into smaller chunks that I can then upload into YouTube Shorts or if I want to put them somewhere else, I have the ability to do that. So if you are wanting to just get the most exposure possible, that's a great way to do that. I'll put a link to Opus Clip down in the description. It's also a really great way that if your content type supports it, if you end up getting busy to where you can't make content, that you can actually use some of those clips to publish content because you can do vertical content and you can do 16 by nine ratio content as well. It just gives you that opportunity to where you can make something out of content that you've already made if you're in a pickle and you're not able to stay consistent on the channel. So there's a lot of advantages to it. The next thing to really focus hard on is authenticity. So when it comes to YouTube, authenticity has always been a thing. It's been a huge core factor when it comes to YouTube, but a lot of content creators, especially when they're getting started, they'll come onto YouTube and they'll try to act like another content creator, or they'll try to act like a news broadcaster, or they'll try to act like one of the entertainment channels where they're screaming at the camera all the time and things like that. But keep in mind that those those things are appropriate for some of the channels and content types where they do that, but it's not appropriate for everything. If you want to grow a community and you want to really connect with the people that are on the other side of the camera, instead of taking that approach, try to just talk to the camera like you're talking to a friend. And when you do that, one, it's gonna make a huge difference in how you present overall, but it's also going to help you communicate in a more authentic way. To help with this, I recommend that when you're by yourself, and this is gonna sound crazy, so bear with me, but I recommend that when you are by yourself, that you occasionally talk out loud like you're talking to someone that isn't even in the room. And again, I know this sounds crazy, but this will help you be able to communicate with the camera in a more natural way because you're gonna be practicing it when you're not in front of the camera. And the 
reason for this is because it's really easy when you're alone in a room and you're talking to a camera to talk at the camera. But in reality, you're talking to the people that are on the other side of the camera, just like I'm talking to you right now. So because of that, it's important to make sure that you're practicing that because it can be really easy to go the other way and talk at the camera instead of talking to the people that are actually watching your videos. And as a pro tip, when you're communicating, it's also helpful to think that you're talking to one person. Because if you start using language like, hey guys, in that particular case, then it becomes like, oh hey, I'm just talking to a bunch of people instead of you, right? So as you're watching this right now and I'm talking to you, I'm looking in the lens and I'm telling you right now that it is you that I'm talking to. And when I have that approach and I'm using that approach, it makes it feel like, yeah, he's talking to me. And I'm sure as you're watching this, you can feel exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Whereas if I say, hey guys, this is what you guys need to be thinking about, it's a totally different thing because then it becomes about everybody and not about the person that's watching your videos. I know it sounds crazy, but focus on that and it will help you make better connections with the people that are watching your content. And most importantly, learn about the people that you're serving with your content. Learn about the things that they care about. Learn about the things that bother them. Learn about the problems that they're trying to solve. Learn about the things that they're most interested in. And over time, learn about what they want most from you. If you combine that with everything else that we've talked about, you're going to do awesome. And look, if you're a new content creator, I just put out a video talking about grifters on YouTube and people that are trying to sell you stuff and mislead you as a content creator and all of that. It's a really informative video and people have really enjoyed it according to the comment section. So make sure you click into that video. I'll put a link to it right here. And thanks for watching this video and I'll see you over here in the next one. Quick ground check. It looks like that piece of that flower is re-blooming and blossoming again, I told you. We'll be doing more clones of that coming up. Then we gotta put some more water in this pineapple because you know they like water from the top. So we'll be doing that too, keeping up with it. So why in hell would you self-report? Self -report? And, and by self-report, I'm, I'm talking about, about the, remember what we mentioned earlier, earlier the self-reporting of trade lines or trade references that maybe aren't being reported over on your business record profiles. So sometimes, sometimes you make a payment, payment, you make two payments, payments and you'll say, man, this sucks. sucks. Nothing's reporting. I follow everything to the Q or everything to the T. Nothing's reporting over on my side. side. Right? Now, now this, this is the record from experience, uh, uh, experience business where they have 500,000 suppliers extending credit but, but only about 10,000 10, of them are actually reporting it. That's, that's directly from Experian business. Now, now with self-reporting, I want to be very clear with this. You can only self-report your trade references, not with uh, Experian, not with Equifax. You can only do it with Dun & Bradstreet because you're wondering, why would I want to have... You only have five months to get your slice of $90.5 billion and it forever goes away. I wanna make sure I cover this and you gotta stick around to the end because this is one piece of paper to get $32,000. $32,000 worth of a check to you from the federal government that they owe you that they're hoping no one will be talking about except they don't know. I read the fine print, so you don't have to. So you want to make sure that you don't miss out on this $32,000. If you had a side hustle or so anything during 20 and 21 that was Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, self-employed, real estate agent, all kinds of stuff, anything with a W-9, a 1099, all kinds of stuff, this covers it. I'm going to go into detail about that. I also want to talk about all the steps that you can get so much more money. So I'm going to talk through seven steps for you to get that money, and I'm going to finish it off with telling you with one one piece of paper how you can get $32,000 because I really don't want you to miss out on this because you got five months and no one, no one is going to tell you about this. It's already been funded. It's already been passed by Biden. 
and by Trump. We've got two different things we're going to be talking about here in two different programs that you can still access even more. I'm going to cover seven critical steps that you can get even more money than the 32000 that you need to take in order to get the money that you want. There's all kinds of funding available from grants to loans to tax credits. You know we cover them on this channel because I don't want you guys to miss out on a single dime. That's how we roll here. However, these funds need to be allocated to state, local, and territories, and guess what? Even tribes. Yep, tribes on reservations by December 31st, 2024. You do not want to miss out on this, and especially maybe tell your local government officials they need to hand over the money. You don't even have to threaten them. You can just ask them for it. If they've not used this by that time, it's going to all be returned to the federal government. And you know, anytime we return money to the federal government, they just get us more in debt. So I want this to go to your pocket, not them. I'm going to show you exactly how you can take advantage of the money before it's too late. So stick around. I have just one piece of paper that you're going to have to fill out to get a check for $32,000. I'm going to show you how to do that towards the end of the video. While you're here, please subscribe and hit the bell notification because if not, if you're hearing this video six months from now, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. That's just how YouTube is going to show you what you're interested in at the time. So you'll miss out on grants and free money that you can get sometimes with just one minute of your time. Also, throw a comment down below if you've gotten grant money because I'd love to feature you on the channel. If you don't know who I am, my name is Andrew Cartwright and thank you so much. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're back, welcome back. I'm here to help you get money, leverage it and invest it. I can relate to where you are because I have been where you are. I don't care what it is from broken homeless a multi-millionaire four different times finally locked in the success how i did it was i started 32 companies i don't recommend it it's kind of brain damage i uh, still have brain damage and in 17 different industries, I bought 17 companies and I've exited five times. Now, I just want to help you accomplish your dream. If you have a 680 credit score, you can run a business. We need to talk. Down below is a link called Epic 99. We're buying 99 companies together. You and me, right? We're going to be partners. You'll own 81%. I own 19%. I'm not doing anything. Just so you know, I'm just putting up the money for the business. Don't expect me to come to work at any time in the future because it's not going to happen. But if you're interested, make sure you hit down below. Also, $30 USTD could be in your account if you open up a trading bot with Pinex, which is also down below. Pretty cool. And if you fund it, you get bonus money as well. So make sure you check that out as well as grab your free stock down there. My real estate program. I got all kinds of goodies in the description. Also, I don't reach out in the comments. I'm not going to ask for your phone number. And please don't get scammed by one of these scammers. Please don't do that. All my information is in the description, my Instagram, everything. So if you want to contact me, that's the place to do it. Now, let's get into the video. Right now in mid 2024, which is where we are right now, now, uh, you know, midway through the year, there's still a whopping $90 billion that's allocated for you. COVID money they have not given out yet. And it's funds that you can grab with your own hands and put it in your own bank account and buy your own car, maybe even a Tesla. They're only 20 grand now for like Hertz is getting rid of them. So anyway, this includes money that state, local territories and tribal governments need to use as well by December 31st, 2024. If they don't spend this money, then it goes back to the federal government as well. This is not part of the 32,000. That's one piece of paper. I'm going to cover that in just a little bit. This leftover cash is part of that massive relief effort from the government to tackle the economic and social impacts that we are still experiencing now which means if you're experiencing it now from your business or whatever else happened, if you're still experiencing it, it still counts. It's all started with the big package, the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Program. And of course, the American Rescue Act plan. CARES Act, Donald Trump. American Rescue Plan Act, that was Biden. Both of them signed up to give you like four or five trillion dollars. These are designated to help individuals, businesses, government bodies, and people that have been hit by that crazy pandemic that we went through. I know we're all trying to forget it. The CARES Act was passed in March of 2020. It was huge, $2.2 trillion of economic assistance. There's still money left over there. It includes direct payments to individuals, expanded unemployment benefits, and major funding for health care providers and small businesses. The PPP is a major part of the CARES Act as well, offering forgivable loans to small businesses to keep their employees employed during the pandemic. Followed by that, they had the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021. This is where Congress stepped up and said, hey, we want to give $900 billion as well to extend 
unemployment benefits and offer more support to businesses and also the distribution of the vaccine, no matter what you feel about it. Then in March 2021, the American Rescue Plan Act came out. It brought another $1.9 trillion. Still money left over from this that people are not asking for. You got to ask for it. This includes direct payments to individuals, expanded unemployment benefits, substantial funding for state and local governments, education and health care. Now, most of these funds have been used. Let's just face it. The money went fast. But about $90 billion still left over for grabs. Still some good money. It's not as much as Elon Musk is worth, but still $90 billion. There's also money from the ARPA that needs to be spent by December of 2026. So you got a little time for this. This is to help state, territories, tribes, and local governments respond to the act. Now, to get your hands on what's remaining, $90 billion. This is on top of the $32,000 i am going to cover with that one piece of paper. But there are a couple of steps you need to do that can help you because I want you guys to be on a mission to help get all the money before it goes back to the federal government. So you need to know these steps. The first step is you need to identify eligibility, whether your business qualifies for this. Many have earmarked nonprofits, small business, education, government programs, all kinds of health related projects, infrastructure, improvement, economic development, like they want you to do something right? Different funds that you can get. The second thing after you've identified it is you need to, to understand the funding source, where it's coming from, different funding, different requirements for the application. But that's why we have a government to help you get through this. Understanding these differences though and asking the questions will help. The third is you need to reach out to our state and local government. They have phone numbers. You call them, you email them, reach out to your state and local government office. They offer relief funds to distribute through all different types of channels. And they now they're even putting them up on their websites. The grants they have available, the loans they're offering, as well as funding opportunities that you can go to the local office for. The next, you need to review the government websites. This is the fourth step. Check out your websites. I know you may have thought and all this is forgotten. They would love you to forget the fact that the money is available. They want you to forget about it. I don't. The U.S. Department of Treasury has all types of different programs. The National Council of Nonprofits and Guidance has assistance remaining. The National Conference of State Legislators have money from the ARPA that's still not allocated. Contact them. Also, Prepare your application. That's step number five. Identify the relevant sources, determine your eligibility and fill out the application. Gather all the necessary documents that they want, financial statements or projections, whatever they need and give it to them. Sixth step is attend informational workshops. They're still going on right now by government agencies. These workshops are to help educate you on how to get this money. They can't just call you on the phone and actually give you this money. It's not gonna happen, but they wanna give it to you. Now, these are all different ones, all these categories have a little work involved. The 32,000 is only one piece of paper, but these are valuable insights. And number seven, advocate for these funds. Make sure you ask for them, reach out, present your case, follow all the steps, increase your chances for success by following the steps. Remember, these funds support a wide range of opportunities. For more details, make sure you visit the U.S. Accountability Office for that information. They offer a comprehensive resource and an update. Now, let's get into the $32,000 one, your check that's got to come to you. This is the Self-Employment Tax Credit, SETC. You probably won't hear about it. Your accountant probably won't bring it up. That's why I'm bringing it up. It's a big, big deal. A big tax break for self-employed folks that were hit by COVID-19, allowing you to get an extra $32,000, in your pocket. It covers 10 days of sick leave at a full-time daily income up to $511 a day, 60 days of family leave, 67% of daily income at $200. And to qualify, you must have been self-employed from 2020 to 2021, which is a big chunk of you guys, especially people who work for Google and work for Meta, all like women in the cloud that I did videos for that are all 1099 that I hope you guys hear this video. I hope you haven't left my channel. But at any rate, if you've done that and you were part of that disruption related in 2020, 2021, $32,220 check could have your name on it. While 2020 return deadline has passed, there's still time to get your 2021 return. If you didn't make money in 2021 and 2020 due to COVID, well, 2019 net income still works. 2019, I know we're going back years. Submit your application by April 15, 2025. Use the form. This is the piece of paper I've been talking about. It's form 7202. Make sure you grab that form, fill it out. Don't miss out. If you're eligible, 
act fast, consult a tax advisor, or go online for the tool and get started. Whether you're a nonprofit looking for support for your community, a small business trying to bounce back, there's still lots of COVID relief money still available. You guys can reach out and ask for this money. I don't want you to miss out because the clock is ticking. This money is going to go back to the people who don't know how to use it properly. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe because only like 60% of you are subscribed. So come on, join the channel. It's free. Also, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. My name is Andrew Cartwright and all my socials are available in the description. Take care. Love you. can be quite relaxing. Everybody run for your life! The Grim Reaper is tending the garden again! <laughs> Grim, you're...